the solar system, the neighborhood of our planet Earth. Since its foundation in 1958, NASA has had a mission and key objectives for the study of celestial bodies surrounding our home. Our goals are even more ambitious, but the path that remains to understand our small corner in the universe is still very extensive. Up to this new century, we have carried out 112 missions, among the most notable are Cassini Huygens, Voyager, Galileo, and Mariner. Each one has tried to extract the maximum amount of information possible from our neighboring planets, from the closest to the farthest. We have been able to know and study, like never before in the history of humanity, the satellites of Saturn and Jupiter, being able to study their intriguing atmospheres and the conditions that keep these gas giants in orbit. The possibilities of life in our neighborhood have increased with the progress of research. Microorganisms may abound on many of these planets, taking different forms and adapting to the most extreme conditions. The case we are addressing at the beginning of this century refers to the anomalies recorded on the planet Neptune in the last 10 years. The study was carried out by Dr. Ronald Dagerstein and Dr. Rosemary Mackey of the Voyager 2 team, who are experts in the analysis of temperature, mass, orbital position, and climatic conditions of the gas giant. With the first images related to Neptune's position with its satellites in 1985, the analysis of luminosity and reflection were decisive in establishing the average temperature ranges at the approximately 30 astronomical units from the Sun. In those studies, it was determined that these temperatures would be around 63 Kelvin, minus 210.15 degrees Celsius and minus 346.27 degrees Fahrenheit, strangely the same as Uranus, despite Uranus being 11 astronomical units closer to the Sun. The research team, supported by contrast images, allowed them to observe that the activity of Neptune's rings was a significant factor in influencing a warmer temperature relative to its distance from the Sun. The movement and gravitational effect created a condition in the atmosphere that produced higher energy levels than the comparison with Uranus, which was identified with much lighter ring chains. Making the comparison, this equality in temperature would also be reinforced by the similarity in the composition of the atmospheric layers, with the difference found in the production of methane condensation on Neptune and the warm layer above this activity, which was already mentioned to be influenced by the rings. Upon thermal analysis in 1988, experts noticed that Neptune's activity was considerably biased. It was characterized by a series of spots that, in contrast to other areas, emitted much more heat than the rest, even warmer than Saturn's spots. On the other hand, the cooler areas showed less fluctuation over short periods of time and tended to slightly but consistently lower their level of kinetic energy. This phenomenon caught the attention of scientists because it involved unusual activities on a planet, activities that had not been recorded in any of the others studied to date. Therefore, it was decided to conduct exhaustive annual monitoring to analyze any type of variation in the atmosphere, also monitoring storm activity inside, which seemed not to affect the outermost layer. By early this year, the definitive data on the variation in Neptune's external temperature was compiled, shown in a record that indicates a significant drop since 1994, following a slight increase that surpassed Uranus in the comparison. Until 1999, there was a dramatic drop of almost 10 Kelvin, and models indicate that the temperature continues to decline up to the present. Thermal images of relative spectrum also show how the initial heat points have disappeared to the point that this year, the planet is in a state of complete freezing with no atmospheric variability. Furthermore, decreases in total mass and gravitational effect concerning its satellites have been detected. These calculations, barring glaring errors, would point to one thing, an external force is extracting part of the planet without a known purpose. This theory may possibly fuel science fiction, 
but it is part of the reality of studying celestial bodies. It is essential for the committee to respond and initiate deeper investigations into this phenomenon that, projected to 2080 or 2100, could result in Neptune's size being reduced to less than half and its likely disappearance due to an energy kinetic extracting force. We hereby issue a warning about an unknown danger that could either retreat once it consumes the planet or continue moving closer to the Kuiper Belt. It's on target. I repeat, it's on target. Determine luminosity with the 20-second exposure. Color and intensity analysis. Comparison to November 1999. 7% less luminous. A Dyson Sphere is a hypothetical megastructure proposed in the field of astroengineering. The theoretical concept of this structure involves a spherical envelope surrounding a star, specifically designed to capture and harness all the radiation emitted by that star. The primary purpose of a Dyson Sphere is to optimize the collection of solar energy for the benefit of an advanced civilization. It is speculated that this massive construction could house human habitats, facilitate the production of resources on a cosmic scale, and address the growing energy demands of an evolved society in the interstellar realm. Although to date, no evidence of the existence of Dyson spheres has been detected, their theoretical consideration has significantly contributed to the exploration of future technological possibilities and human expansion in the universe. In the theoretical conceptualization of Dyson spheres, various variants have been proposed, each adapted to address different needs and challenges. Among the hypothetical types of Dyson spheres are Thin-shell Dyson sphere, a structure that surrounds the star in thin layers, optimizing the capture of solar energy and minimizing the material required for construction. Dyson swarm Instead of a single massive sphere, it envisions a series of satellites or independent structures orbiting the star, working together to collect energy. Multiple-shell Dyson Sphere 
similar to the thin shell sphere but with additional layers to provide habitable environments and specialized zones for various functions. Lattice Dyson Sphere, a structure consisting of a lattice or mesh around the star, allowing the passage of a certain amount of radiation to maintain specific conditions inside. Incomplete Dyson Sphere, a partial construction around the star, which may be in the process of expansion or intentionally designed to leave specific areas without encapsulation. Cloud-type Dyson Sphere, a more dispersed variant, where instead of a solid sphere, widely distributed energy collector clouds are used around the star. In 1995, Dr. Henry Favre, a member of the Light Contrast Photographs Astronomical Analysis Department at NASA, conducted a specific study on anomalies detected on the planet Neptune over the past 15 years. His field notes were systematized and delivered to the head of the security department at the institution for a thorough investigation regarding the anomalous condition of the gas giant. Dr. Favre's conclusions led to intensive investigations by astronomers associated with NASA and various universities in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Between 1997 and 2001, they internally published the following papers within the NATO Space Security Command, highlighting the following data of utmost relevance. When conducting a systematic review of studies from 1997 to 2000, in comparison with previous years, but not limited to the study of Neptune alone, they considered that this could be due to some anomaly in the outermost region of the solar system, as a characteristic of celestial bodies farther from the Sun. However, they were greatly intrigued by an external flow to the Oort cloud that maintained a similar, if not identical, pulse to the energy movement in Neptune. Having examined these data, astronomers published the primary conclusion in the present year, 2001, 
which pointed to the increasingly plausible possibility that the so-called Oort cloud, surrounding the solar system, is, in reality, one form of a Dyson sphere. Its interior may well serve as a spatial reserve of energy from which a civilization considerably more advanced than humanity is obtaining resources from the Jovian planets. Alternatively, the entire solar system could function as some sort of experimentation farm for this civilization. This opens a high probability that human life, as well as that of other animals, is a product of an artificial creation external to the chance occurrence of events. Following studies that date the moon as older than the solar system itself, it becomes necessary to evaluate this parameter and accurately date the rest of the celestial bodies, which could have been deliberately placed within a Dyson sphere under entirely controlled conditions. The Western world still celebrated the scientific cultural triumph of the arrival of men even years later. An unprecedented technological feat in the entire history of humanity. For the first time, a human being, a living species under the Earth's atmosphere, had conquered territories beyond its natural physical limitations. The world would change forever. The boundaries of what was humanly possible had changed radically, marking the beginning of an era characterized by the civilization's interest and need to explore beyond planetary borders, opening the way to the cosmic neighborhood that had been waiting for it for millions of years. It is not less curious, and more than debated, how, with the technology of the time, it was possible to send a group of men into space and bring them back completely safe. The advancements, compared to today's standards, were terrifyingly simple. All records made of each minimal test, each prototype, each action protocol, required hundreds and hundreds of pages and a team that at times had to work with calculations done by pencil and paper. However, it is necessary to clarify that when it comes to scientific advancements, in service to humanity's development, at some point, it dramatically shifted towards international security purposes, towards military and, above all, private purposes, these were not phenomena exclusive to the 20th century. There is an innocent belief that man has lived most of his history in misery and underdevelopment, this is partly an absolute truth, but history, always written by its victors, has diverted us from a place in the course of human intelligence that has been several steps ahead of the civilization experience. The service of cognitive development in the interest of private entities has elevated scientific knowledge to unsuspected levels because the world is much more complex than one might believe in advance. Since 1789, there have been records, many of them incomplete or not fully authorized for complete disclosure, of discoveries and inventions that have been kept in the utmost secrecy, patented and secured by astronomical figures and extortion networks that spend generations of power. That's why it should not be surprising that every technological revolution is nothing more than the offspring and remnants of a generation already exhausted and surpassed in the sphere of private development. Many of the tremendous advances in technology were useful decades before they were commercially known. And likewise, the progress in space-related sciences and its conquest. January 1973 The private space agency FX-77 began the first analyses of its third and most successful mission to Mars, a planet that had been orbited and studied since 1940 through unmanned artifacts, mainly for investigative purposes related to the soil and its precious metal riches for the projected development of 21st century industries. However, 
No agency had so far ventured into a purely exploratory enterprise of the Martian landscapes. It was undoubtedly a lousy business, with huge losses and results destined for the aesthetic enjoyment of its main investors. Nevertheless, the investigations were acquiring an intriguing value, producing economic returns as the incomprehensibility of their initial results became apparent. With the development of color photography since 1921, exploratory images of the Martian surface offered a complete and precise visualization. From the beginning, expectations were more than low, as the first photographs, which took no more than three days to reach Earth, did not show a landscape much different from the arid deserts of North Africa, and its monotony was a real headache for those who had invested large sums of money for a greater surprise. But these surprises would not take long to arrive. March 1973 the old stories of human mythology have never had a real connection to the real world. Beyond the obvious and slight references to the knowable and perceptible, the magical and divine elements that underlie all supernatural action and interference in our world have been nothing more than impractical solutions to the relentless certainty and order of nature in its purest state, always difficult to grasp from concrete thought. But this is nothing more than an arrogant argument, dismantled by the ambition of those who have based their own world on the most sterile and predictable aspects of nature. The photographs handed to the FX-77 agency left no option to deny the interference of ancestral entities in the cosmic neighborhood. Not only were bones of complex living beings such as mammals or reptiles recorded, but also structures very similar to those erected by humanity itself thousands of years ago. Pyramids and temples had been ravaged by a wild and unknown nature for men, but there was the greatest evidence, the most conclusive proof that it was not necessary to search millions of light years away in galaxies that might harbor life like ours. They were just a few thousand kilometers away, they had existed at some point in human history existing parallel to it. September 1973 There is information that is often desirable never to know, and that was precisely a phrase that no one wanted to endure. They had crossed a limit, in the shadows of everyday progress, and there was a truth that could not wait for a global consensus for its search, especially if it could harbor results even more incomprehensible for the human species than nature itself. As the year progressed, particular attention was paid to the dating studies of the Martian soil's antiquity, as well as the materials of the monumental structures found. By that time, the development of conventional dating had made considerable progress in research and refinement, and it was, coincidentally, in the 1970s that it became popular and received the largest monetary contribution in the history of the scientific world in a traditional sense. The agencies interested in dating the Martian territory saw in the results the urgent and suffocating need to take that world of lights, that world of limitations and slow progress, beyond its own known capacity. The world had to delve into the study and appropriation of its own history. The Martian discoveries were irrefutable and exorbitant. That world devastated by dust and reddish sands had not coexisted in the past with humanity, not even with the prehistoric. A Martian civilization was not even contemporaneous with dinosaurs or single-celled organisms. It could have been a mistake, perhaps, but the experiments were repeated enough times, yielding the same exact results to be treated as a misalignment or misunderstanding of the tests themselves. There was a civilization that existed at a time difficult to call the past, as its dating exceeded the possible beginning of the universe itself. That civilization was in a past that, topologically speaking, 
could be in a future of the human timeline. Time exhibited an incomprehensible property of inversion, making its own antiquity located at a point where space-time would become, for human conception, but, in the same way, had already occurred and perhaps was happening at the same time. If that aberration of the fabric of the universe was a few months away from Earth, it was entirely possible that humanity itself was part of that nonsensical space-time, and that the past was nothing more than the remnants of a dynamic that would repeat endlessly in a loop, perhaps, that discovery had been the anchor point between both inversions of the sense of time. November 1973 The die was cast, there was no greater sense in investigating the Martian soil. The tests continued week after week, hoping for more answers regarding temporal inversion, but nothing satisfied the cravings for denial. These were not merely dating tests, there was an awareness of the activity inherent in each of the structures found there. Many will recall the controversial face on Mars disseminated in 1975, causing a stir and consternation across society. Subsequently, as is always the case, such a discovery must be debunked and aligned with the official, everyday, and sluggish version of conservative scientific progress. Humanity was hardly prepared for such transcendental revelations, and that had been the main proof. The Martian horror did not lie in finding pyramids built by humanoid extraterrestrials from a distant past or the discovery of civilizational remnants. That is only of mundane, persecutory, and paranoid interest. The face on the surface of Mars hinted at an even stranger phenomenon after the second set of photographs revealed that it had disappeared within a matter of hours. For the entire press and the public communicative apparatus of this event, the face in the first image was dismissed as a perspective error, a terrifying periidolia of a couple of poorly photographed mounds. However, the truth had stranger undertones than that. The Martian surface possibly was a type of entity with a certain intelligent, malleable, and imitative capacity. Since successive investigations did not address this event, to this day, there have been no private reports on the nature of the planet's surface. It has been theorized that, possibly, Mars and other celestial bodies are a type of structural entity with partial imitation capabilities. This would explain the imitative face resembling a human and the planet's very form. It is probable that most celestial bodies mimic each other, taking on spheroidal forms as a mirror, concealing their unknown original form. Since time immemorial, man has gazed at the sky and sought to unravel the mysteries of the celestial vault, so deep and dark. From the night skies, prophecies have been declaimed, omens interpreted, and it has served as a stellar map for navigators and seafaring explorers. Science has been interested, from the beginning of history, in understanding all the phenomena that occur above our heads eager to study celestial bodies and the movements of the stars. Before the invention of the modern telescope, civilizations had limited insight into the sky. Technological limitations hindered any interest in knowing beyond what the eyes could perceive. However, thousands of years ago, the Sumerians and Akkadians had certain notions of the existence of planets beyond what revolved around a luminous source, the sun. Despite their tremendous disadvantages, simple sky observation already provided clues about the cosmic order, 
even beyond what we now know as the solar system. Unfortunately for these civilizations, it was entirely impossible to know what those luminous phenomena in the sky were. Despite changes in light intensity or colors, they could not imagine what these were, what kind of objects they were, their size, their relevance in the cosmic neighborhood, and not to mention the remote idea that there might be life there. Saturn has captivated observers since the dawn of recorded history over 50 centuries ago. In early history, Saturn has been associated with omens related to both politics and everyday life. This situation changed little until the early 17th century when Galileo and his contemporaries, using telescopes, began systematic observations of Saturn. Observers in the 17th century documented a variety of forms for what are now known as Saturn's rings. Galileo himself depicted the rings as solid circles, one on each side of the planet. Others represented a solid elliptical ring plane, but one that contained unusual openings, like circles and diamond shapes. There are also records where the absence of rings is striking. The differences among observers and the unusual appearance of the rings are actually attributed to the low quality of telescopes in the early days and the lack of a conventionally accepted manufacturing method. By the late 18th century, bright points were observed on the edge of the ring plane. Reports stated that one of these points even moved repeatedly in position, so evidently that there was no room for chance. However, none of the bright points persisted for long, less than 16 hours, ruling out the possibility that they were satellites or bodies with regular orbits. The observer, William Herschel, posited in 1789 that some kind of unstable source must be responsible, like an intense fire. Another perplexity has been the observation of one ring arm while another could not be detected, and systematically so, as if they changed their angle around the planet. Bright points continued to be reported by keen observers in the 19th century. Once again, Saturn's satellites had to be ruled out since none could be located nearby. The most surprising and now famous observations of a light source occurred in the 20th century on February 9, 1917. Two astronomers, Maurice Ainsley and John Knight of Britain, independently observed the source. The brightness recorded from the source was so intense that Ainsley directly called it a wandering star. The star followed a straight path that indeed covered about 125,000 kilometers. The observed time to cover this distance through the ring system was 1 hour and 40 minutes, yielding an average speed of 21 kilometers per second. If this value is compared with the average speed for a Voyager en route to Saturn, which is approximately 13 kilometers per second, the star's speed was almost twice as fast. During the observations, when the star was in view, easily detectable, its light seemed to take on an elongated appearance. Although there was something very strange in its trajectory, as it moved over the ring plane effortlessly, it seemed to devour the material from it as it progressed. Voyager 1's results have added new perplexities. In ring F, positioned outside the main ring system, intense electrical discharges similar but much larger than terrestrial lightning have been recorded. The explanations that science has given to all the mysteries of many celestial bodies have not only been consistent from a theoretical standpoint, but also through corresponding photographs. For example, regarding Saturn, the oldest observations have recorded different forms of the ring system, 
which is easily explainable due to the low sophistication of telescopes. However, the changing luminosities surrounding the planet have not been clearly differentiated from the trail of its natural satellites, and theoretically, they have not been satisfactorily resolved from a general consensus. In the second century before the Common Era, in what is now Saudi Arabia, local astronomers had developed technology that had nothing to envy from Galileo's telescopes, or even more modern ones. Despite the difficulties of the time, these men had devised a clever way to observe in greater detail each of the stars in the firmament. It was a lens as large and tall as the size of an average person, from which, given its unique properties, it had the possibility to significantly magnify what was projected onto it. Given this remarkable characteristic, it was built to be functional with the least possible light and also the most distant, so this device only worked at night and performed better with completely clear skies. With this marvelous lens, they could project surprisingly detailed visions of some planets that had been hypothesized until then including the most distant ones like Neptune and Pluto. Unfortunately, for religious reasons, much of the astronomical records kept in the great library of Muhail were burned in the 7th century after the Common Era with the rise of Islam. Many advances in astronomical science were, in fact, thoroughly censored, and their authors were cruelly punished for trying to go beyond human limitations. This became equally common for other sciences over time. However, in 1872, transcripts were found in the present-day Albanian town of Pagari, which, according to archaeological and anthropological records, are directly related to the prohibited writings of Muhail. In these transcripts, extensive descriptions and studies of a planet called Al-Kura min al nujama Mutagayira an Arabic expression for sphere of changing stars, were found. According to current astronomical records, it was concluded that this celestial body was Saturn, and the changing stars referred to its rings. But, the greatest surprise from the data of these ancient records was not the curious precision about its diameter, orbit, and even an approximation of its particular density but the account of the peculiar observable feature of shape change. Over 2,000 years ago, men in the desert were able to observe strange luminosities that came and went around Saturn, differentiating them from its satellites, which had also been identified at that time. But this was not all they had observed, as the writings detailed how those luminosities sometimes intervened with such intensity around the planet that it considerably reduced its diameter, while at other times it seemed as if it inflated. The same happened with its rings, which reached much larger sizes than those currently recorded and were seen producing strange ripples surrounding the central sphere as if it were a beehive. The influences of these luminosities were such that they sometimes changed the orbit and rotational movement of the planet. Unfortunately, these records are mostly incomplete, so the most exhaustive connection between modern investigations into strange phenomena in Saturn's rings is frankly impossible. Nevertheless, this type of discovery opens the door and motivates researchers to search remote sites around the world for the existence of ancient records. As valuable as any modern inquiry into those aspects still unresolved in the cosmos, His condition worsened so rapidly that we didn't even have time for a clinical interview. The only information possible to gather was through testimonials from family members. The presented symptoms corresponded to an internal infection 
that was difficult to explain. Thousands of parasites were consuming him, so we had no choice but to place them in a level 4 isolation chamber in the underground wing. The examination was quite challenging due to the extreme risk of contagion. takes 224 days to orbit the sun. Little Mercury just 88. Mercury never strays more than 43 million miles from the sun and is perpetually scorched and irradiated. Pictures from Mariner 10, a space probe sent to Mercury in the early 70s, reveal barren and a world of extremes. Temperature by day It was the 1960s, and the space race between the United States and the Soviet bloc was in full swing. With the successful moon landing in 1969, the results were evident. The technological superiority of the West had clearly triumphed over Eastern development. Thus, after years of intense research, Humanity finally succeeded in sending one of its kind, not only into Earth's orbit, but directly onto the surface of another celestial body. Joy, excitement, and above all, the sweet taste of ideological triumph left American scientists, military personnel, and leaders thirsty for more. While 1969 had meant a definitive triumph with the clearest demonstration, the space horizon seemed limitless. If the incipient technology of the time had achieved it on the moon, not much more would be needed to start visiting the space neighborhood. Thus was born the only project that, due to its more than fatal results, has no official record of missions carried out by NASA, Project Mercury 1. American ambitions seemed limitless, as reflected in the decision of NASA's then planning chief, Thomas Dublin, strongly supported by Pentagon's Foreign Affairs Secretary, Edward Mitchell Schmidt. Together, they proposed the idea of sending a manned spacecraft to orbit Mercury for as long as necessary to study it and extract the most information about obtaining new sources of energy. This was in the context of the foreseeable depletion of oil for a few decades, leading to future energy conflicts and, naturally, possible federal savings. Mercury was believed to have an enormous variety of compounds of great value on Earth. Due to the ancient theory of Ankenan Raison regarding Mercury's past and its relationship with the sun's thermal effect which would have enhanced those compounds inside as if it were a fermentation. The Mercury mission involved a rapid adaptation and understanding of the lunar model of space travel with times that needed to be extended considerably as well as more intense physical preparation for the astronauts. Additionally, the suits had to be manufactured to be even more resistant to ultraviolet radiation, just like the spacecraft module. It would undoubtedly be a risky mission, but with the caveat that a descent to the planet was not necessary. The planning of the crew journey, beyond providing valuable information through direct observation of the tests, would be the, the definitive test and expression of American hegemony at levels never thought of since the development of the atomic bomb. The four crew members of the mission received special training between 1970 and 1975 with the goal of orbiting Mercury by the end of the decade. The technical advice of the scientific team also called on the best space engineers and astrophysicists from the Western Allied Bloc 
to carry out the definitive construction of the rocket and module. Scientists from renowned universities in Japan, Germany, Denmark, France, and the United States focused all their efforts to come up with the best possible design, innovating in as many aspects as had yielded fruitful results in the moon landing. In 1979, on May 4th, the Mercury 1 mission took off from Cape Canaveral. The entire process, unlike the trip to the moon, was arranged with the utmost secrecy and discretion. In fact, the information was not made public until the date of this documentary in 1999. At that time, NASA communicated through its spokesperson that it was merely testing prototypes for future lunar and orbital explorations. Cracked and battered for the planet. The craters testify to the sun's immense gravity. Space debris plummets inward. Nearby Mercury is in the line of fire. Mercury's surface is like the hidden side of our moon. Both have great circular basins, and Mercury isn't much bigger than the moon. With absolute precision in the trajectory and speed of information reception, the journey's duration was established at 19 months, where, as planned, the spacecraft experienced sudden accelerations caused by the gravitational effect of the Sun. This energy was immensely useful in shortening the journey and taking advantage of space conditions. The astronauts' good condition was confirmed at all times, and there were no incidents that put their lives at risk. Through cameras placed throughout the module, as an innovation for the most visual records possible of the planet, images of Mercury were recorded in a total of 503. These were revealed and analyzed in 1982, once the astronauts returned to Earth. It was at this moment that the problems began. The analyzed photographs revealed unexpected images for a planet that was supposed to be entirely rocky and compact. Huge holes were found all around Mercury, some several miles in diameter, with a perfect appearance of being excavated by some kind of intelligence. Additionally, inside those holes, strange lights were observed, as well as limbs of biological entities that, judging by their appearance, must have been some living and conscious entity The only photograph taken from the surface of Mercury was one in which a small probe was launched to impact the planet, attempting to provide the most data and information before being destroyed by high temperatures. Upon arrival on Earth, the crew managed to enter the atmosphere with a ship that, according to their own comments, suffered serious damage, apparently due to natural friction so the planned return that had been stipulated ended with the ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean near the coasts of Panama. When the return ship was transported to the United States, it was noticed that it had not necessarily been affected by the friction of atmospheric entry, but it was in an external state of corrosion produced by some parasitic organism that had adhered to it. A greater surprise came when they realized that the interior quickly began to fill with this rare black mucus. Initially, they thought it might be an unexpected reaction to some maritime microorganisms, but then they confirmed that this material had not been identified in any way in the Pacific Ocean. After noticing this, the medical and technical team at NASA decided to monitor the health of the astronauts, who reported no discomfort despite the strange black mucus eating away at the ship day after day. 
In interviews with the astronauts, they mentioned nothing of this. In fact, the journey was much better than stipulated for most of the way, with minimal inconveniences. But everything changed six months later, when from the ship, already completely engulfed in the still unknown substance, a curious life form began to emerge from the mucus, about 90 centimeters long, similar to the tentacles of some marine animal, but showing no particular interest other than traversing the interior of the ship. In that same period, the four astronauts urgently arrived at NASA's special unit, reporting a rapid blackening of their upper limbs. Upon analysis, it was found to be the same material as the black mucus that had engulfed the ship. Unfortunately, the substance's rapid abrasion covered the men completely within three days, giving them no time to comment on their symptoms. They had already arrived unconscious at the health service and were put into a coma within a few hours. The last we heard from Anatoly Volinsky's testimony was all about the new images captured by the Narod 4 telescope, which we had attended alongside the head of the Computational Analysis Department at its inauguration in September 21. Anatoly Volinsky was in charge of the photographic transduction of all processes within the Narod complex. With the inauguration of the most powerful telescope in Eastern Europe and Asia, he was promoted within the ranks of national security agencies. His new position involved the initial review and preliminary compilation of studies on raw images from all Narod telescopes. This role granted him access to federal matters without requiring specific and formal authorization from the Minister of Defense. He had been entrusted with this position due to his extraordinary service in the space program for nearly 25 years and impeccable evaluations in the psychometric tests administered to every worker every six to eight months. Alongside Mr. Lomadiv, he was one of the few still enjoying such privileges in the agency after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Those who had the unfortunate privilege of reading Anatoly Volinsky's report suffered even worse consequences. Some of these workers were sent to the infamous Kanchalan camps along with their families without any reasonably justifiable argument other than national security. Others were permanently relocated to the third underground floor of the Trans-Neptunian Affairs Building, where they underwent the mandatory and binding protocol tests that any worker entering warranted in terms of their results and conclusions. Part of Anatoly Volinsky's testimony was recorded in room 307 where he was asked to read his own report in front of a recorder. Outside the room, in an adjacent booth, were those of us who would evaluate his account using a wave transformer and a real-time spectral beater. We knew that anyone entering room 307 must be there for reasons ranging from serious to extremely serious. It was unusual to receive personnel without having heard any rumors that would give us a clue about what we were about to face. Anatoly Volinsky seemed nervous, a bit hesitant, but that could be better explained by the anxiety of being in a high-pressure situation that was surely not part of his daily routine. The orders were clear. Obtain a faithful, clean, and secure record of what Narod 4 had captured on the morning of September 28th, avoiding direct listening to the testimony. Anatoly Volinsky was quite insistent about what he had observed in the photographic transduction, and he seemed not to comprehend the danger that this insistence posed to the safety of anyone listening to him directly. The man repeated without any hesitation that the Zavrsheni phenomenon had been captured in a vast number of frames and that, if not studied in time, would pose an imminent danger to the safety of the human race. With the same insistence, he went on to describe it in gruesome detail. Beyond Neptune, where the ridiculous theorization of the Dyson Sphere was once suspected, the term ridiculous was repeatedly used by Mr. Anatoly Volinskich, 
There was no place for any artificial structure. American studies had been wrong and blinded by their materialistic and technologist ideology of an anthropomorphic concept of the evolution and development of the universe. There would be no civilizations beyond the planetary or even galactic neighborhood that we shamelessly called intelligent, a concept derived from studies that define and delimit the cognitive capacity of creatures from a human perspective, limited to the brain understanding of a species casually existing in the universe. Beyond Neptune, just a few steps away in astronomical distances, and who knows if less, were the humorously called world devourers. They don't devour worlds because there is no way of knowing if their material composition contains any structural programming that provides them with the instinct of feeding or instinct per se. It could even be what has been theorized from the eastern side of the world, like the walls of space-time, which, always thinking of them within a geocentric logic, would make their way through existence and accidentally sweep away their vesicular structures with whatever stood in their path. In the strangest of cases, those holes would send the galactic neighborhood outside the universe into a cosmic interstice of which there would be no way to know its conditions because it is a state outside the rules of the study of known reality. The testimony seemed vague, corrupted, and initially suspected of some undetected psychosis in Anatoly Volinskik. However, the images were there, in the investigative folder, and attached in their first impression and statistical analysis in the report. Although that wasn't the real problem, it wasn't the reason for the care that had to be taken with Anatoly Volinskich's raw words. The only real reason was what his words provoked in those who had heard him. Those men who were sent to the Kanchalan camps had not been victims of political censorship, much less, but of something much stranger. Of the walls of space, moving counterintuitively through immaterial dimensions, like the words of whoever had transformed them from the visible spectrum to the sound frequencies of speech.